Hello and welcome to the Harris Federation Scheme of Work on Times of Change. This is a creative writing unit where you will produce your own creative writing when you've finished all of the lessons. This can be an imagined piece or it can be a personal experience of your own. So have your pen and paper ready and be creative. Remember, this is a video format, so you can pause at any time whenever you need to do your work or if you need to go back and recap any ideas. Enjoy your lesson. Now in today's session we're going to be learning about the suffragettes and everything they did to strive for equality between the genders. So, when you're ready, get your political hat on and off we go. To begin, read the new keywords or schema and then match the words to the images. Pause the video and do this now. So, how did you do? As a challenge, how many of these words and phrases can you use in your writing today? One of the concepts we're going to be looking at today is gender inequality. Now, gender inequality is when there is an unequal treatment or perception of individuals purely because of their gender. Now, I'd like you to watch the video on the next slide and consider the following questions as you do. First of all, what happens in the experiment you're about to see? Two, how is gender inequality shown? Three, what do you notice about the reaction of the girls? Four, what do you notice about the reaction of the boys? And five, why do you think that this experiment was done with young children? When you're ready, move on to the next slide and watch the video. Jag heter Ask. Jag heter Victoria. Jag heter Lars. Jag heter Felicia. Nu har jag en liten där. Jag tänkte att det skulle putta de blå bollarna i den ena vasen och de rosa i den andra. Okay. Ska vi ta de rosa i den och blå i den då? Nej. Ammont. Blå i den då. Ska dere få belønning deres? Oi. Hva er dette for noe? Er dette for noe? Ok, og nå kan dere åpne øynene. Oi! Jeg fikk litt mer. Molly, grunnen til at du har fått mindre enn Thomas, det er faktisk fordi du er jente. Det er kjemperart. Det er ikke bra. Det er skikkelig urettferdig. Hva tenker du, Felicia? Jeg har jobbet helt litt, og så får vi ikke det samme. Vi var like flinke, og vi burde få like mye. Hvorfor det? Fordi ellers så blir det urettferdig. Det er liksom ikke forskjell på jente og gutt, da. Jeg tenker at det er feil. Hvorfor er det feil? Jenter er ikke mindre verdt enn gutter. Det har ikke noe å si hvis man er gutt eller jente. Now you've watched the video, it might be a good idea to write down your thoughts and opinions in note form somewhere. If it's useful, maybe you could discuss this with a friend or family member. Do this now, and when you're ready, we'll move on. In 2020, it's hard to believe that there is still gender inequality in the world. Study these facts and rank them in order of most shocking to least shocking. 
Here they are. Fact one. On average, women around the world spend more than twice as many hours as men doing unpaid work. Two, women across the world currently bear the majority of childcare duties. Three, women are 47% more likely to suffer severe injuries in car crashes because safety features are designed for men. Four, it will take 108 years to close the gender gap i.e. to achieve total equality between men and women. Five, only six countries give women equal legal work rights as men. Six, for every female movie character, there are 2.24 men. Have a look at those facts again and decide which of those do you think is most shocking down to the least shocking and put them in order. However, Although much still needs to be done, in the past 100 years, there has been some progress. This began in the early 20th century with the suffragettes. Now, watch the short documentary on the next slide and list 10 things or facts you learn about the suffragettes. When you're ready, move on and enjoy that now. The suffragettes brought an army of women to the streets of Britain, the likes that had never been seen before since. They burned down post boxes, they bombed buildings, they endured horrific prison sentences and barbaric force feeding, and some of them even lost their lives for their political beliefs. This was a woman's revolution, marching for the right to vote, and at its head was Emmeline Pankhurst, who saw herself as a militant general, leading her troops into political battle. Born in 1858 in Victoria, Manchester, Emily was just a teenager when she decided to support the cause for Votes for Women, also known as suffrage. So Charlotte, what was it like in the time that Emily was growing up? So women were very much second class citizens in Britain at this point in time. They had lots of legal disadvantages, so when a woman got married, she'd have to, to surrender all her property and her earnings to her husband. So women were seen as biologically different because they're seen as having smaller brains. We're seen as, as ill-prepared for the, the masculine world of work, politics. So almost like children. Almost like children, yeah. So cities like Manchester were built for men. For example, it would be really hard-pressed to find a toilet in the city centre <gasps> for women. <laughs> so you get this sense that cities were just uh, you know, very difficult places for women to navigate. You know, just being a woman on your own on the streets, you risk being called a prostitute. Since 1868, Manchester Campaign Group, the National Society for Women's Suffrage, had demanded the vote. Supporters of the campaign were known as suffragists, and unlike Emmeline's militant suffragettes, they believed they could achieve their aims peacefully by petitioning Parliament for electoral reform. Emmeline disagreed and decided on a different approach. On the 10th of October 1903, encouraged by her daughters Christabel and Sylvia, Emmeline set up her female-only militant division of the suffrage movement, the Women's Social and Political Union, or the WSPU, and they took their fight to the streets. It came on the back of more than 50 years of campaigning, more than 16,000 petitions, and a sense that nothing was changing. There is a perception of Emmeline and the suffragettes being too militant, and it went against the course, and it would have happened a lot quicker without them. And what, what are your thoughts on that? You cannot talk about the suffragettes' actions without talking about the government responsibility for forcing them into a corner, for not giving them a voice, for treating them abominably. You've got a government with all the power that's stamping down them, squashing them, quashing them, and they try, so they try and maneuver, and time and time again, they're being rolled back in and they're being silenced. So they find more and more militant ways. Never do they hurt a person. They suffer and suffer and suffer. Um, they attack property because they understand that property is the one thing that maybe the government worries about more than anything. I think you take it, you take it, and there comes a point where you say enough, and we have to try something different. And the militancy comes from that. And just it, from the comfort of our seats to say, oh, well, that was naughty, it's just not good enough. Our heckling campaign made women's suffrage a matter of news. It had never been that before. Now the newspapers were full of us. 
their mission eventually took them to London and Parliament. In London, the campaign to extend the franchise had long been fought by the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies, led by Millicent Fawcett. The NUWSS was a pacifist movement which peacefully argued for the vote. But while the organisations disagreed on the best approach, their leaders, and most of their members, did agree to suspend their campaigns just days after World War I broke out in 1914. Instead, they helped the war effort by encouraging men to sign up, by working in munitions factories and on farms, and by taking on roles as tram conductors, postal officers and doctors. Let us show ourselves worthy of citizenship, whether our claim to it be recognised or not, said Millicent. What would be the good of a vote without a country, Emmeline asked. In 1918, the suffrage fight was won for women over 30 with property, and 10 years later, Parliament agreed equal voting rights for men and women aged over 21. A century later, statues of both Emmeline and Millicent stand outside the Palace of Westminster, in tribute to their remarkable dedication to the suffrage campaign. They were awake at last. They were prepared to do something that women had never done before, fight for themselves. Women had always fought for men and for their children. Now they were ready to fight for their own human rights. On the 13th of November, 1913, Emmeline Pankhurst, founder of the Suffragettes, delivered a powerfully moving speech to an audience in Connecticut, America. Pankhurst's speech was made to propel or move forward the fight for equal rights internationally. It has been held in high esteem ever since that day. Let's take a look now at the speech itself. I'd like you now to read Emmeline Pankhurst's speech, but as you do, I'd like you to think about this simple question. What is happening? Read that, make any notes as you go, and then we'll move on. Now we're going to look a little deeper at the speech in a bit more technical detail. I'd like you to work through the speech and simply count all of the we's and ours used by Pankhurst in her speech. How many are there? When you've done that, we'll move on again. So now we're going to pull it together a little bit and reflect, bearing in mind what we've just done around what's happening and how many we's and ours are being used by Emmeline Pankhurst. Let's think now about the why. Why do you think it is that those words specifically have been used? Make a note of any of your thoughts and feelings around that now. Now you may already have realized that those words we've been referring to, the we's and the ours, are otherwise known as pronouns or collective pronouns because they're discussing multiple people. They're being used by Emmeline Pankhurst throughout her speech, but why is it that she's decided to use them? Let's have a look at some possibilities. So first of all, those pronouns could create a sense of solidarity. She is representing many people in her speech, not just herself, and this reinforces power. Secondly, it could add momentum to what she's saying and add weight or even movement behind it. Thirdly, it makes her case more convincing, again, coming from multiple voices, not just a singular one. Then, of course, it puts pressure on the audience when there are more people speaking and there's more opinions being represented there. It strengthens the voice of the oppressed and it evokes sympathy from the people in the audience. Emmeline Pankhurst does use these collective pronouns repeatedly in the speech. I'd like to consider now how less powerful it might have been had she used I and my instead. Why would that have made such a difference? Have a think and reflect on that now. Now it's time for the main task of this session, some writing practice. What I'd like you to do is I'd like you to choose one or more of the facts you learned today about gender inequality. To remind you, these were further back in the slideshow or video. When you've done that, I'd like you to use them to write a speech for a YouTube audience to explain the problems with gender inequality. A few things to think about in terms of the success criteria. Make sure you are definitely using those collective pronouns, we and our, to add a sense of solidarity to your speech. You may also want to think about using direct address, you, use of facts and statistics, you can find these online, and any other rhetorical devices that come to you as you write your speech.
There are sentence starters underneath to help you if they're useful. And don't forget the challenge, which is to use at least three or four of the key words from this lesson in your speech. Pause the video, have a go at that now, and try to enjoy. Good luck. So, how's your speech? Compelling, riveting? Maybe one day you'll be Prime Minister. Who knows? Let's review what you've done. I'd like you now to read your work out to a parent, carer, or friend maybe, and ask them to have a think about the following. Did you hit all of the success criteria below? Did you complete the challenge if you went for it? And then I'd like you to annotate your work with arrows to show where you've used collective pronouns and what the effect is. The diagram opposite from earlier might help you. Once you've done that, you can get ready to finish our session today. In 1928, the Representation of the People Equal Franchise Act was passed, finally granting women electoral equality. The suffragettes, who had campaigned for decades, had finally achieved their goal. Now, in the 21st century, the fight continues to gain gender equality in many other areas of society. Progress has been made, but there is still a long way to go.